Hi everybody. Uh, today we're going to work on section 11.3. Uh, it's titled Taylor Series. We've actually seen some Taylor Series already, but uh, just want to uh, sort of nail this stuff down. So, the, first off, the definition. We've looked at Taylor polynomials in the uh, in section 11.1. Uh, these are things like what's underlined right here in the middle of the page. We've got a, a constant coefficient, then a coefficient times x minus a, another coefficient times x minus a squared, and so on up to uh, a coefficient times x minus a to the nth power, where n will be the degree of the polynomial. But if you include the plus and say dot dot dots, right, then, then you're going from the polynomial to the series. So the series is written using sigma notation like this. It's a sum starting at a zeroth term going to infinity, ck times x minus a to the k. Now, the um, I, I kind of like the way the book has done this, but they've sort of um, teased the pieces apart there. Part, part of what we've got is x minus the center of the series raised to a power. The other part is a coefficient. And on a separate line, they say what that coefficient is. Um, it is, you figure out the kth derivative of the function, you evaluate that at the center, at, at a, this is where the expansion is centered about, and then you divide by k factorial. Those, that dividing by k factorial actually makes natural sense if you think about uh, what happens with the derivatives of, of x to a power. You, end up getting factorials sort of built into the derivatives. So by dividing out that factorial you're, you're sort of getting closer to the natural value of the of the uh, number you want there. Okay, uh, there do mention the special case of the Maclaurin series. That just means a is zero. So you're, uh, I'm not quite sure why they, they bother to distinguish that case, except apparently this guy Maclaurin, uh, there, there's a marginal note here. Try to show you. There it is. Uh, they're named for this fellow named Colin McLaurin, who described them in a textbook in 1742, significantly after Taylor had already uh, described them. So I guess just because it was a maybe it was a book textbook that a lot of people used. In any case, uh, that's common terminology to talk about the McLaurin series. Okay, so. Let's get to using some of these Taylor series. Um, actually, there's hmm. there's two points that are made here just under the box where they define the Taylor series. One is we need to know that the series, if if we're going to use it, it, it needs to converge, right? or at least on some interval. There has to be some x values for which it converges, but also um, we need it to be equal to the function we're talking about. Um, it's it's strange. That's a. Does it seem possible even that you could have a function whose Taylor series did not agree with it? Well, actually, there are examples. So I don't think we'll spend a lot of time looking at uh, these sort of strange counterexamples. But uh, most of the time. A Taylor series or a Maclaurin series uh, does indeed converge over a nice interval surrounding the center, and it converges to the function you're interested in. Uh, there, there are conditions which guarantee that convergence, but I don't think we need to get into the technicalities here. Okay, so um, the first example, example one there, is a good place to start. Example 1a is the function is cosine of x. And we could just follow along in the book, but I, I think I'd rather uh, rather do it by hand. So f of x is cosine of x. Um, notice that the derivatives of cosine just cycle through the four possible uh, possibilities: are plus and minus cosine and plus and minus sine. So uh, Let's figure out what the nth derivative is at 0. We'll do the center of this at 0, OK, um, for several values of n. 
Now, if n is 0, that's the function itself. You haven't, you, the zeroth derivative is you haven't done anything, right? So this, this function evaluated at 0 is 1. Uh, the derivative of cosine is negative sine, right? But at, uh, I'm doing it right. I always get confused once we're in Calc 2 because, you know, integrating, differentiating, which way are we supposed to go? Yeah, it is negative sine. Um, but the sine of 0 is plus or minus the sine of 0 is 0. Uh, the second derivative will be minus 1. That's going to be negative cosine of x and evaluated at 0, minus 1. And there's an easy pattern on these derivatives. The uh, odd numbered ones are 0, and the even numbered ones alternate back and forth between plus 1s and minus 1s. Sometimes you're at cos x, sometimes at minus cos x. Yeah. So, we know what our derivatives are. Let's think about what the kth coefficient is going to be. It's going to be um, negative 1 to the power uh, k over 2 is what I would actually use. This is a tough one, actually, because, uh, you know, we've got to come up with a formula that will be 0 as well as plus and minus 1. Maybe I should be watching how the book does this. Oh, they escaped the issue. I see. Well, fine. <laughs> So uh, we should follow the same trick. Um, right, let's just call out. They only give you the coefficient for even values, c of 2k, which makes sense that all the odd values are, are 0. So c sub 2k is negative 1 to the k uh, divided by k factor. Excuse me, divided by 2k factorial. That's our coefficient. So then. Can we write down the, the first several terms of this uh, Maclaurin series? Let's see. The first, the, the constant term is 1. There is no linear term. There is a quadratic term that has a minus 1 half as the coefficient. I'm just plugging in k equals 1 into that. Right? The, the, the co th this is the degree 2 thing, but that corresponds to a k equals 1. All right, negative one half x squared, and then we'll have plus hmm, when k is when k is two. This is plus and four factorial, so that's one over twenty-four x to the fourth, and then it'll be minus. Gosh, what is this one? Six factorial, seven twenty minus one over seven twenty x to the six. So those are some of the terms of the Taylor series. Now, um, let's look at those Taylor series with one of these uh, uh, Desmos graphs. So here's here's the uh, the graph of cosine. It's in the black here. The red curve is going to be our sum. Uh, well, it's the Taylor series that we've got, except that it goes up to a value of k. I'm just uh, kind of Inch through the yeah, inch through the, the first few values of uh, of k. So there's k equals one. Now that's actually our degree two Taylor polynomial. Whoops, I didn't mean to jump that far. Uh, here's three. K. All right, let's get two. There it is. When k is two, that's our degree four Taylor polynomial. That's actually the you know the prototypical shape for a fourth degree polynomial. Kind of looks like a a curvy w, and you see that it fits the almost perfectly along the entire first arch of the cosine. Um, okay, so there's two. Three is this one. Now that's a degree six polynomial, because uh, you see in the formula here, it's x to the two n. So when k is three, that's degree six. This is not the, what a typical six degree polynomial looks like. Uh, usually six degree would have 
uh, I can't count them, but there's uh, five turning points. <laughs> so, yeah, wait. It has n minus two turning points, so four turning points, but uh, or points of inflection, I should say. Oh, I see. That's that's the problem. Um, turning points is is the spots like the peak and the valleys that we see here on the cosine graph. That's where the direction of the graph changes. And there are five turning points in a degree, degree six thing. There are four points of inflection that lie in between those turning points. And uh, this doesn't seem to have that feature. But anyway, it, it is a six degree polynomial and it does fit the curve, the cosine curve, quite well. You see that that, that approximation just with, well, what is it, the constant? 0, 1, 2, and 3. We've only got four terms in the Taylor series, and it already is well matched to the thing. Um, when we get to 4, the, the matching is even better, almost through the uh, an entire wavelength, you know, from a valley right here to a peak to another valley over in a positive area. But we can keep making it better and better and better. And we've quickly gone to the point where, you know, I'm only at k equals 8. There's only 9 terms to this Taylor series. Well, this polynomial, really, because it's I haven't done the full series. Um, but it's already, you know, indistinguishable from the graph over the entire uh, span of graphs that we're looking at. So uh, I should probably zoom out a ways so we can see that it does separate. But if we keep cranking these derivatives up, they go you know, the portion of the thing that is, is uh, matched with the graph goes farther and farther out. We, in our activity last week, we, I asked you to guess about the interval of convergence for this, and uh, I think it's pretty clear that at each time we knock the um, degree up by one, we're getting about pi over two more uh, span to the thing. So this eventually will converge everywhere. The, the radius of convergence is infinite. Okay, um, let's look at the other example that was given in our text here. Uh, we, we just went through the finding the, actually, really it's just the, uh, the Taylor polynomial so far. But um, the other example I wanted to do was 1 over 1 minus x. One over one minus x. Let's let's. Um, I think I think I've sort of approached this from the opposite direction before. We took uh, the geometric series and showed that it could be expressed as one over one minus x. But you can also just directly figure out one over what one over one minus x is. Um, that is, it's a rational function, right? So you can do division. Uh, divide 1 minus x into 1. 1 goes into 1 once. And 1 times 1 minus x is 1 minus x. And when we subtract that from what's above, 1 minus 1 is 0, and minus minus x, we get x. And then 1 goes into x x times. Right? Multiplying back, we get x minus x squared. That needs to be subtracted from what's above. I'm I'm doing a I'm playing a dirty trick on you right now. You see, the the way we normally write polynomials is the high degree down towards the low, right? And I've written them in reverse uh, because that's the way series come up. <laughs> anyway, but one goes in. Well, oh, we have to subtract first. That ends up with an x squared. So one goes into x squared. X squared times. And is it clear that we're gonna the pattern is gonna continue? We're just gonna get this, this thing. Well, okay. These two things are not truly equal. Um, when you when you think about one over one minus x, you're thinking about a function that is undefined when x is one, but other than that, it's perfectly well defined. It's well defined everywhere. When I think about this infinite series, however. The trickery that I pulled actually rears its head. This this is only a function if it does converge, and this only converges if x is little. Right? If x is bigger than one, these large powers of x blow up. 
So um, the series uh, converges only if x is in the interval from minus 1 to 1. So if we want to look at the Taylor series for, for that function, 1 over 1 minus x, we won't get a Taylor series that converges to the entire thing. We want to get one that works on an interval. Let's, let's just change this one. Um, I want 1 over 1 minus x. Okay, oops, it's a little more. Let's see if I can make that go under there. No. Okay, just have to type it in. Let me get rid of that part. There's 1 over 1 minus x. Why does it still show me the red? Oh, because I've got a Taylor series. <laughs> Most of the, the Taylor series with so many terms in it, or the Taylor polynomial with so many terms in it, that it uh, looked like it was cosine still. I'm going to change this upper limit. 50 is just going out of the, a little bit crazy there. How about 20 is an upper limit? Um, all right, 1 over 1 minus x. Now. I can tell you what the series is going to look like, I think. It just has x to the n in it, doesn't it? Just trying to get rid of some unnecessary parentheses. So, uh, yeah, that's all it is. It's uh, x to the n power, n is the variable, the, the um, summation variable here. If I turn this thing on, oh, we don't want that many. When k is 0, we get x to the 0. That's 1. And you notice that the graph, the black graph, and the red line agree at that one point. But you wouldn't expect it to do much better. If I bump this up to 1, now we've got the red line and the black graph not only agreeing, but tangent to one another. And I can go to 2 and get a quadratic, then a cubic, then a fourth power, fifth power. Now, unlike the deal with the sign where, remember how the, the area where the thing had agreed with the graph just kept spreading out and spreading out and spreading out? This isn't doing that. As I take this degree higher and higher and higher, it's just kind of flipping back and forth between plus and minus infinity. So that's because of what we're just talking about over here. The, the, con the series only converges on this interval, minus 1 to 1. Let's look at the graph just in that interval. Um, we're going to want to rescale things, aren't we? I want to be able to see the graph over a lot of, um, you know, I want to see it well. Now, the, you should notice that 1 over 1 minus x has this vertical asymptote at x equals 1. Um, and let's bring our Taylor series back. The Taylor series rather quickly approaches the graph on this interval. I'm only going up to the degree 20 Taylor polynomial approximation, but it's, it's good. Up there, its value is 20, whereas the function goes to infinity. But you know, 20 is a fairly large number. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, uh, yeah. But but the 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 value of this thing at one is just going to be the degree of the polynomial. It turns out, so that number is in fact going towards infinity because we're going to let this k go to infinity. Okay, so I I've, so far I've just played with this as a series. I didn't do what Taylor asks us to do, which is figure out derivatives and evaluate them at zero and use those as the coefficients. Well, maybe dividing by a factorial. So we've got a little bit of work 
ahead of us, but let's see if we can pull it off. Um, the function, the function we're dealing with is f of x is 1 over 1 minus x. Can we take its derivative? Sure. That's uh, going to need a chain rule. But uh, think of this as 1 minus x to the negative 1 power. Right? So when we multiply up front by the power and then reduce the power by 1, we get this much. And then we have to remember chain rule that the, the inner function there, uh, we need the derivative of it, which is another minus 1. So yeah, this is plus 1 over 1 minus x quantity squared. Or if you like, you could say 1 minus x to the negative 2. But it's positive. OK, uh, let's take a derivative of that. What's the second derivative of our function? Negative 2 comes out front, and then the power goes down by 1, so it'll be at negative 3. A repeat of the inside function right there, and then the derivative of the inside function finally needs to be multiplied on to you know, fix it with the chain rule. And again, it's positive because those two minus signs cancel. And so this is really 2 over 1 minus x cubed or if you prefer, 2 times 1 minus x to the negative 3. Let's do one last one, and then I think we'll guess at the pattern, and, and we'll be right, because we've had a lot of experience with derivatives now. Uh, the third derivative, we would have minus 3 times 2, that's negative 6. 1 minus x to the negative 4, and then there's that minus 1 from the chain rule, and the two minuses cancel again, so we get 6 over 1 minus x to the 4th, and then uh, we could also write that as 6 times 1 minus x to the negative 4th. So, uh, what are these coefficients? Well, they were, uh, oh, sorry, I've, I've been doing the, the work for the function, the derivative, the second derivative, the third derivative. We also need to see if we can put it in here right next to it. Let's eval at zero. That is, uh, stick a zero into the formula. Well, okay, that's not so hard. One minus zero is zero, the reciprocal. I just said that funny, didn't I? 1 minus 0 is 1. Reciprocal of 1, it's still 1. Yeah, so that one's 1. Uh, the derivative, I think you also get 1, don't you? Because 1 minus 0 squared is 1, 1 over 1. Yeah. Then we're going to get, uh, at the second derivative level, we're going to get, what do we get? 2 times 1. Okay, so that's a 2. And here it was a 6. And what do you think it is in general? I mean, that's a sequence of numbers we've seen a bunch. Those are the factorials. So what, what I'm claiming is that the nth derivative evaluated at 0 is n factorial. Okay. Which means the real Taylor polynomial here would be those values n factorial divided by n factorial times x to the n. So that, yeah, it doesn't really do anything. The series we got by just long division and the series we get by all this work with derivatives are the same. There's a certain uniqueness. I did want to go back to one other uh, example of just generic stuff we did with, with, um, with series before. If you've got a series that converges on an interval, like this one does, one, on the interval minus 1 to 1, it converges, um, then you can do calculus operations with it. Now, what is the integral 
with 1 over 1 minus x. That's a, you need a quick u substitution. u is 1 minus x, and then du would be negative dx. And that's, nat well, it's the negative of natural log of u. Okay, so we get negative ln of 1 minus x. That is a Taylor series that I did a while ago. So do you see the, that this is actually what I was, had up on the screen when we started today. Um, again, don't know what I was thinking to make that go all the way to 50. That's too high. So 20 will be plenty for us to get an idea of what's going on. The, the graph in black is the natural log of 1 minus x. Well, it's the negative of the natural log of 1 minus x, but I have limited it. It's restricted its domain so that we're in the interval where the series converges. And we can bump up the, the upper limit of that series until it we, we sort of watch it converge. It gets better and better and better in terms of approaching the graph. And this one's still kind of far off at the right side, but if you look at the middle of the graph, it's it's already perfect. Probably nine decimal places. Well, it's a million. It's all decimal places right at the origin, but uh, <laughs> yeah. That's most of probably not going to show us that. Anyway, the series I got here could also be gotten by taking the, the, the 1 over 1 minus x and just integrating it term by term. That is, your, your original f of x is 1 plus x plus x squared plus x cubed, etc. And the new guy is it's antiderivative, so I guess I'll call it big F of x. Uh, it's x and then x squared over 2 and then x cubed over 3 and then x to the fourth over 4 and so on. You see that in the formula I had given here we, uh, we don't have a zeroth term we start at n equals 0, but see the actual uh, power on x is n plus 1. So the smallest degree you have here is 1. And you're dividing by, well, successive numbers. The, the, the thing you're dividing by matches the uh, power on x, which is what we were seeing over here, too. The 2 and the 2 and the 3 and the 3. Right. So... Yeah, that works. You can integrate term by term, you can differentiate term by term, and then you can also literally integrate or differentiate and realize that you found the unique Taylor series approximation for the natural negative of the natural log of 1 minus x. That's it. Uh, that one's probably not a uh, one that I want to do by sort of Taylor methods, finding all its derivatives, so that would be a little bit harsh. So the last thing we really need to do before we uh, leave Taylor series is show an example one that's an honest about Taylor series, not a McLaurin series. So um, I'm looking again at the graph of 1 over 1 minus x, because it's a great one for, as an example. It has this vertical asymptote at 1 and you know the, the minus 1 to 1 region over which the standard series converges is shown here. Let me just uh, back off that restriction on the domain. See the whole thing. Now this graph actually is perfectly well defined in other places as long as you're away from zero. So um, I, I chose a point on the graph, three comma one over, well, that'd be one half, wouldn't it? Oh no, it's negative one half. Right, there's, a, there's a point and I, what I would like to do is get the Taylor approximate, the Taylor polynomial and then eventually head towards the Taylor series for this thing at that spot, at the, at, well, with the x minus a, where a is 3. Okay, so to do that, we're going to need to uh, remember what that list of derivatives was. 
we worked them out so there, there was a nice pattern to it, but now I'm gonna, there's gonna be something different, right? We're no longer gonna wanna evaluate them at zero, but maybe I can do this in red and it'll stand out. But instead of at zero, we're gonna evaluate at three, at the x value, the x coordinate of that point that we're using as the center. Right, so um, when x is three, this is 1 over 1 minus 3, that's uh, negative 1 half. When x is 3, what's this one? 1 minus 3 is negative 2 squared, it's positive 4, that thing is 1 quarter, 1 fourth. When x is 3, what's the second derivative? Negative 2 cubed, that'll be negative 8, and then 2 in the top, and I think that's negative 1 quarter. When x is 3, I'm sorry, negative, two, I'm sorry, it's negative 2 to the fourth power, that's positive 16. Hmm. Well, let's just write it as 6 over 16. Now that's tougher. I don't know if we can see the pattern that's developing in those coefficients. It probably would help if I hadn't simplified. This is, um, at least that one there should have been not simplified. Leave it, leave it as negative 2 over 8. And now perhaps you see the pattern. It's alternating, but also uh, we've got powers of 2 in the denominators and factorials in the numerators. So that's no longer what we get for our general term, but the nth derivative evaluated at 3 is going to be n factorial in the numerator and 2 to the n in the denominator, or is it n plus 1? Yeah, it's n plus 1 in the denominator, uh, because at our third derivative we got 2 to the fourth. Right? At the second derivative, that's 2 cubed. Yeah, right, the, the number on the derivative is 1 off from the number that's in the power. Okay, and there's also a alteration, alternation, negative 1 to a power. Now, what power do we, are we going to use? It actually starts on a negative number, and the smallest value of n is actually 0. So uh, this is actually, we, we're going to need to put an n plus 1 in there to make that, uh, change the parity of the, the exponent on the, on the minus 1. All right, I'm going to put all those things into our Taylor polynomial. The, the power is going to be negative 1 to the k as our variable, so k plus 1. No, I don't want to do that, do it. I have to use parentheses to group that. Then we have k factorial and we have x to the k and then we're dividing by k factorial. Gosh, I feel a little silly about putting those two things in there because there, uh, <laughs> there is indeed in the formula for the Taylor series that we'll be dividing by k factorial, but our derivatives had a k factorial in them. Yeah, so we, we're really eliminating both of those. The other element is 2 raised to the k plus 1 power downstairs. I'm, I'm unhappy with this as it stands because we can we can do better. So let's let's before we, we press on and you know look at the graphs. Let's take out these ex extraneous k factorials. There's one in the bottom, there's one in the top, but they would cancel. 
Also notice that the, the minus 1 to the k plus 1 and the 2 to the k plus 1, those could all be written as a single thing, negative a half to the k plus 1. So let's, let's do that. It's negative 1 over 2 to the k plus, darn it, <laughs> got to remember those parentheses, k plus 1 x to the k. Hmm. Well, let's show this. When we're starting with uh, n is 0, the upper limit is 0. Well, that's good. It agrees. It goes through the point when we make it did something stupid. Well, I guess this is a good teachable moment here. I figured out the derivatives and did all that stuff at n equals at a equals 3, right? But I did not stick x minus a to the kth power in here. Tommy. So this should have been x minus a to the kth power. Ooh. Like that. And now, do we need a slider? Oh yeah, well it's, we actually have a particular value of a in mind. X is minus three to the case power. Wow, now it should work. Um, there's the n equals zero case, just matching the point. There's one matching the slope as well as the value. And wow, it seems like it's converging great. You know what's happening though? Off, over here on the right hand side. And even as I let the degree get higher and higher and higher, it doesn't seem to get past matching up around 5. In fact, the low degree terms were better in a sense than the higher ones because they, they launch, you know, they end up peeling away from the, the graph we're after. Why is it doing that? Well, our center is at 3, and the function has a singularity on it at, minus, at 1. So the radius of convergence can at most be 2. <laughs> and that means out this direction, from 3 over to 5, is also going to be, you know, the radius of convergence so that is a symmetrical thing. You, you go that same distance on either side of your center to find the, the region that the thing converges over, and it just won't be good beyond there. Yeah. Cool. And we did this the the sort of old fashioned way, right? We actually calculated a about a, a sequence of derivatives until we could guess what the sequence of values of the derivative was at various val at various uh, degrees, at values of k. That was great. And it worked, right? You can you can see that the by the time you get up to n equals thirty, it's almost identical to the graph in that region between well between one and five. If you want it to be better, just take the n here up to a higher and higher number. There is just one last little detail to uh, to take care of, which is that we need to actually see Taylor's theorem and what it tells us. So um, Taylor's theorem, this is actually referring back to section 11.1, .1. we kind of skipped over it, but now it's time to face the music. Um, you have a function that has continuous derivatives up to the n plus first derivative anyway, on some open interval i containing the center. Um, then you have this result that for all x in the interval, f of x can be thought can be approximated with the nth degree Taylor polynomial, nth order Taylor, Taylor polynomial, plus something else. That's what's known as the remainder. Okay. Well, that that makes sense, right? You, you can say the function minus the polynomial would would be this remainder thing. But Taylor's theorem actually says something a little better. 
it, what it says is that remainder actually looks like the next term in the Taylor series. See how it's uh, f n plus first derivative and divided by n plus 1 factorial? The only thing that's funky is this should be evaluated at a, and it's not. It's saying c. Uh, the, the rest of it, x minus a to the n plus 1, that in fact is, is the, the right power and the right you know, variable, shifted variable. Um, so where, what is C about? Well, what Taylor's theorem says is that there is such a C that this will be the remainder. That is, you can find some point C. It's somewhere between the X that you're working at and, and the center of the series, and the center that we're expanding around A. So it's for some point C between X and A, that's a formula for the remainder. And that, that means that... Um, we can say when the function and the Taylor series actually are the same. Um, that is almost certainly in these other uh, scan pages that I took. No, not that. No, not that. We're going to come back and do that. There we go. Convergence of the Taylor series. So this this is the same uh, thing we were just looking at. This is now we're in 11.3, but the, the same formula for the remainder. The n plus first derivative evaluated at some point c. Um, the point is this remainder needs to be getting smaller in order for us to say that the series is converging. So look at the the remainder term, and you get convergence of the Taylor series to the function, provided that this limit they're doing right here equals zero. That is, the remainder is getting smaller and smaller as you let n get bigger and bigger. And for some reason, they've rewritten the remainder term. I feel like the thing that should be emphasized is right here, the part about the limit. Uh, so. Yeah, the, the limit of this expression as n goes to infinity must be going towards zero. Uh, which, well, is both of practical and theoretical use. All right, I, I just scrolled past the thing about the binomial series, so I think uh, we should probably take a quick look at that. Um, in fact, I think I'm going to go out to the to my whiteboard and, and give you that. My guess is you guys have seen this a million times, right? This is the first few rows of Pascal's triangle. Um, the numbers in the Pascal's triangle are called binomial coefficients, and there's this, this rather nice formula for them. N choose K would be the nth row, kth position in that row. Um, it's written in terms of factorials, n factorial over n minus k factorial, and then k factorial. And using these, we get what's uh, we, we can get a polynomial that's an expansion of things like x plus one to the n power. So um, I'll write it out in sigma notation, but. That's a sigma going from 0 to n, and choose k, k, x to the, let's use k, x as the power on x would be that. So this is a, a sum with n plus 1 terms in it, so that its degree is the highest term, it's x degree n. That's just a polynomial. Um, but if you, if you write it out, you, you'll see that is indeed what you get by expand, if you expand x plus 1 to the n power. Um, so Newton looked at all this setup, which was in existence for probably 150 years before he came around, and he proposed an interesting idea. What if I wanted to replace n here with, instead of a whole number, maybe a fraction? What if I wanted to do like uh, x plus 1 to the one-half power. 
how could we how could we change things? And um, what he noticed was actually it's it's not really much of a, of, of a thing to notice. If you if you look at the n factorial and the n minus k factorial, you can just cancel all the things in that out of here, and you'll end up with left upstairs n n minus one n minus two all the way to the last one is going to be n minus k plus one. Really out of room there. Okay. Anyway, there's there's k terms in this. There's there's k things right here. Probably better to think of that last one. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Here, I'll, I'll try to skip one of the dot, dot, dots in there. Think of it as n minus k minus 1. Okay? So that, then it clearly, they're numbered 0 through k minus 1. There are k of them. There's k terms there. And in... That was canceling n factorial with n minus k factorial. There's still also k factorial. Okay. So uh, what are now called Newton binomial coefficients, or some people, our book just refers to them as binomial coefficients, but um, happen when you replace n with some real number. So I would call it a, a Newton binomial coefficient. Say uh, alpha choose k. That'll be a descending product starting at alpha and going down by one each term. So you'll have alpha, then alpha minus one, etc., until you get to alpha minus k minus one. And in the bottom will be k factorial. And you can do that. You can make a descending product like that for any real number alpha. Okay. So let's let's do the example of alpha equals one half. Um, one half choose zero. That would be a descending product that has no terms in it, and it would have zero factorial in the bottom. And a product with no terms in it is by default called one. So and zero factorial is also a, a product with no terms in it. So if that's also a one. Uh, something choose zero is always one. That was not as interesting as it should be. Let's look at one half choose one. Well, we'll have one factorial in the bottom. That's one for a good reason, and we'll have a product that just has alpha in it. Just a single term, right? So no terms, one term. The next one is where it starts to, we start to see the pattern developing. Half choose two is, well, okay, one half times one less than that would be negative one half over two factorial. Feel like we need some simplifying. Uh, it'll be negative because there's a, a single minus sign in there, um, but there's two, three twos in the bottom in the denominator, so it's negative one over eight. I didn't simplify this one, but it is one half. So the first few Newton binomial coefficients for alpha equals one half are one a half minus an eighth. I'm kind of at the bottom of the board, but I feel like doing just one more of them. What would, what would one half choose three be? The descending product part doesn't start with a minus sign. One half, negative one half, positive, uh, then negative three halves. We're multiplying all those things. Right? And then in the bottom, three factorial. So uh, this ends up being positive, three eighths in the top and uh, over six. So hmm. 
8 times 6, so that's 3 over 48. I believe that simplifies to 48, 3 times 16. All right, so there we go. One, negative a half. Positive, dang, I said it wrong. One, a half, negative an eighth, positive a sixteenth, and it keeps rolling. There's more. There's an infinitely many of these, in fact. In fact, what this does is lets us do this exact formula, but with n replaced with a half. And the sum no longer goes zero to n, but rather it just goes forever because you can always compute more and more bits. You get an infinite series. Um, this is actually used pragmatically to figure out, you know, well, square roots is, there's other processes, but you can get arbitrary powers, so cube roots, 17th roots, stuff like that. If I do 1 plus x to the 1 half power, it can be, I'm going to write 1 plus x, I probably would normally write that x plus 1. Uh, obviously it doesn't matter, but yeah. Infinite series that if you uh, if you choose x wisely, you can always arrange to get an infinite series that converges near the, the point of interest, and uh, usually the first just few terms of it are a great approximator to a square root. Well, this is it's been erased out, but I I did in fact compute the first few values of a half choose k, so we can write out some of this series. Um, it was 1 plus a half times x to the first power. The next term was uh, negative 1 fourth, wasn't it? No, negative 1 eighth. And then we have positive 1 sixteenth x cubed. But it keeps going. Um, you should see. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, you should see that beyond these first two terms, we begin getting an alternation. <clears throat> so the, the degree four thing will indeed be negative, and then they go plus and minus. <clears throat> Excuse me, back and forth after that. This, um, I, I kind of wanted to show you that this could be used for, some, for something reasonable. So <clears throat> let, me, let me just show you one example of calculating a square root using the Newton uh, binomial series. square root of 5. Now that is the square root of 4 plus 1. Silly observation, but uh, you can sort of take a, a 4 out of that expression. You can write this as the square root of 4 times 1 plus a quarter. Why would I do that? Well, because then that 4 on the inside can be pulled out and it's a 2. So, uh, other than this 2, uh, I have the square root of 1 plus a number smaller than 1. You notice that this series with higher and higher powers of x is in it, and alternation, and it, it's guaranteed to, to converge, provided that the absolute value of x is less than 1. That's what I've just arranged for. So square root of 5 can be approximated as 2 times the series we just wrote it out uh, with x equal to 1 quarter.
course, there's many more terms, but they're getting pretty small. And um, the remainder theorem tells us that the size of the next term is, is uh, basically gives you how it gives you the error, and that the size of the next term involves one quarter to the fourth power and a uh, Newton binomial coefficient that's well, even smaller than one sixteenth. So it's it's a pretty small number. I think we're probably good to three decimal places at this point. So I, I didn't quite trust myself when what I just said there, but it turned out I, I guessed about right. Um, this uh, expansion comes out to be 2.236 and there's a 3.28 after that. And the actual square root of five Actually, it's 2.23606. I'll just write it to 8 there. So, four significant digits agreed, and we get a, a disagreement in, in the fifth. Well, what does that tell you? The calculator uses more terms of the series than we do. But I, I guarantee that's, in fact, what's going on inside of the calculators. It's using the Newton binomial series to get the value and it just needs it needs to be programmed to take it the, the series out far enough that the error is out in the uh, I think these calculators hold 12 digits so out in the 13th decimal place it'll be fine well we I wouldn't be uh, fair to do the series of uh, the do this in the chapter on Taylor series and not show you the, the sort of Taylor theoretic development of it. So take f of x is square root of 1 plus x and think about what its various derivatives are. Of course, it might be nice to write it as 1 plus x to the 1 half power first. And its first derivative is 1 half times, well, same inside thing raised to the one little smaller than that would be negative a half. And then I should multiply by the derivative of what's inside, but that's one in this case, so we don't have to, to worry about it. Um, F double prime would be gotten by taking a derivative of this. Uh, ne another factor of the, the exponent, right? Negative a half times this one half, it's one half times minus one half times one plus x to the, no, it's minus three halves. Um, the third derivative is, what do we have? One half times minus one half times minus three halves. One plus x to the, the new power is minus five halves. The fourth derivative would be one half minus a half minus three halves minus five halves. These are all multiplied together, so don't, it's looking like I'm subtracting there, but I'm not multiplying negative numbers. Uh, one plus x to the negative seven halves now. And let's see, um, we can evaluate all of these at zero and do a McLaurin and see what a McLaurin expansion looks like. So uh, I'll make a little table here in the corner of n and the nth derivative of our function evaluated at zero. Evaluating at zero is nice on these because they have, you'll have one to various powers, right? So in fact, the, the first thing is just one. It's actually the zero thing. No derivatives have been taken, so we get a one. Uh, when it's one derivative has been taken, we're in this line, and it's one half times one. Uh -huh. one half. In this line, it's negative one quarter times one. Yeah. In the next line, it's the third derivative positive three-eighths. 
And the next line, the fourth derivative, it is negative 15 over 16. I, there's a clear pattern going on in the denominators here. It uh, starts with a 1 in the denominator, and then 2, 4, 8, 16. We're getting more and more powers of 2. Higher, uh, In fact, the power of 2 matches with the index. Uh, what's happening in the numerator is a little tougher. Um, we're, we're getting sort of a, a product through odd numbers. It's sort of, sort of a, a, a weird variant on the factorial idea. But it's only the only the odd numbers are multiplied, and then there's also the alternation that's fairly clear. But do we recognize these things? They they are almost the terms we got in the in the expansion of the Newton binomial theorem. The difference is that we also had uh, factorials in the bottom of this. That is, the the Taylor coefficients. Well, maybe I can just. I can't, I'll just fit them in right next to this. C sub n in the Taylor series is just your, uh, it's that derivative evaluated at zero divided by n factorial. Okay. So our C n, uh, when n is zero, is one divided by zero factorial, it's still one. A half divided by one factorial, it's still a half. This is the first one where it makes a difference, will be divided by two factorial. So it's negative one fourth divided by two, negative one eighth. And then we have three eighths divided by six. I believe we worked out what that was before. <laughs> three eighths, uh, well, the, the three and the three cancel, it's, this is one sixteenth. And finally, we had negative 15 over 16 divided by 24. My goodness. Yeah, <laughs> let's simplify that the old-fashioned way. It's negative. There's a 3 times 5 in the numerator. There's 4, 3, 2, 1, 24. And there's also, uh, well, there's also a 16 down here. Uh, threes cancel. The total thing in the bottom is all powers of 2 now. 16, 32, 128, negative 5 over 128. Oh, we never went that far in our, yeah, we stopped at the, at the, any, any, well, after four terms, so we were at n equals 3, right, the 1 16th. But if you needed to know what the next term is, here it is, at negative 5 over 128. So it's kind of cool, the Newton binomial theorem and the Taylor series, well, I, just, I probably should say Maclaurin series, they agree with one another. It's really two different ways of looking at the same infinite series, the same expansion of 1 plus x to the 1 half power.